from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Stu Miniman. I'm Stu Miniman, and you're watching the Cube's Boston area studio. We're, we're talking about storage and SDI essentials, and of course, storage and infrastructure really are there for the data and the applications. To help me dig into this, Rob Coventry and Steve Kennison, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thanks, Stu. Thanks, All Stu. right, so, yeah, when we talk about the, one of the only constant in the industry, Steve, you said in one of our other interviews, is, is change. Um, the role of all of this infrastructure stuff is to run your applications, and of course the applications, you know, the really critical piece of everything we're doing is, is the data. So, Rob, maybe talk to us a little bit about your, your viewpoint, what you're hearing from customers, and help set up this conversation. Well, one of the biggest uh, changes that's going on these days is the move towards cloud, right? And I often kind of want to reset the definition of what we mean with when we say cloud, because it means so many different things to so many different people. To me, cloud is all about not a place, not a not somewhere where you're running computing. While it may have started out that way when Amazon launched AWS back in what was it, 02 or 03, or uh, Salesforce.com, and when they were running uh, everything in the cloud, but it's it's really evolved more to a style of computing, distinct and different from your traditional computing, right? It has certain attributes. Um, it it um, those those attributes are what distinguish cloud computing from traditional computing more than anything. And so basically now um, storage has got to evolve and support that just as like we did with virtualization. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when <coughs> it, it, in the industry we spend so much time arguing over definitions and wait, hybrid, public, multi, composable, composite, everything like that. Well, you know, when I talk to customers, you know, most of them do have a cloud strategy, but yeah. number one is the ink's still drying on what that strategy is, and the pieces that make up uh, that strategy are definitely changing over time as they, they grow and mature, but they absolutely know that no matter where it is, their data is one of the, the biggest assets that they have uh, outside of people, <laughs> and therefore how can they leverage, how can they get more out of uh, data, uh, the whole wave of big data that we were well into and the, the, the next wave of like AI is you know, all data at the center of it. Yeah, and I think uh, I like the way Rob kind of positioned this. We've <coughs> we talked about, you hear a lot of folks talk about cloud, and a big part of what we're trying to do is have them have our uh, sellers as well as the community understand that cloud isn't a place, right? It's a, it's a thing, and you've kind of alluded to, when I want to do specific types of uh, either development or um, programming or provide assets to to the world, whether it be data or whether it be things like websites or that sort of thing, it's got to live somewhere. And where that lives is becoming more cloudy. Now, whether that place is on-prem or it's it's in a, in a cloud or it's in a remote data center someplace, at the end of the day, the functions, right, that you want to be able to deliver on are behave in a cloud-like behavior. And I think that's that's becoming more the trend of what people want. And, and really it's the consumption model of where it lives and how you pay for it is really the bigger part of how things evolve. Yeah, and applications are changing a lot. I mean, you used to say, you know, the era of shrink wrap software is, is mostly over now. It's talk a lot about microservices now and when I'm building things, you, you mentioned functions, which gets into like functions of service and serverless, you know, you know whole new area that, that, that's changing. Um, what, what's needed uh, for you know the, this world? You look at you. You got you know most customers have hundreds, if not thousands, of applications. You know most of those aren't ready for you know that that, that brave new world of cloud native. Uh, there's usually some stuff. So uh, maybe Rob, give, give yeah, us a little bit a good of that question. spectrum and where are your customers and. So look, I doing? think we recognize that uh, people have the vast majority of their uh, infrastructure is running or applications are running on traditional infrastructure, right? And so they've got a couple different choices. They've either got to modernize what they've got, and the modernization is, you know, I, I was sharing with Steve uh, last week, you know, we modernize, we're modernizing our house because we built the house back in 01, it was, you know, golden oak, it was uh, um, gold uh, handles everywhere, and so now we're getting rid of all the gold, we're getting rid of all, painting all the golden oak and repainting the whole house, right? So that's a modernization. It's not a complete refurbish, remodel, that's what we would refer as refactoring, right? That's a much bigger, heavy duty thing. And so uh, businesses are gonna have to look at those traditional applications and decide which of them should 
be just simply modernized and then um, adapted or modernized to, to work with and orchestrated with that bigger um, cloud-like environment and which of them need to be refactored to operate with the underlying cloud infrastructure which by the way expectation is it's completely virtualized it's automated it's policy driven it's orchestrated it's got all those types of cloudy like you know pay on demand types of characteristics that people learned and love from AWS and from Google but now they're getting uh, on-prem as well yeah, I, I, let me poke at one thing, because even sure. you, you say, you know, virtualized, I, I think you don't <laughs> mean just, you know, a hypervisor, but Good we have point. things like containerization, you know, bare metals back, uh, you know, it's so funny yeah. what's, what's old is new again. Uh, remember it was like, oh, we're going to go 100% virtual except for containers and everything else now. So now we've got lots of flexibility into how it's deployed yeah. um, and, you know, there, there's, there's that modernizing the platform and modernizing the applications, and sometimes you do one before one, the other depending on how you're doing it. I mean, not everybody understands the distinction, right, between uh, containers and VMs, right? But it, it, the way I look at it, containers, one of the first things that they were really trying to attack is a more efficient way to do virtualization than what we had with VMs in the past, right? And one of the things that they learned is if they break those applications is into smaller functional microservices, then they get a, another benefit, and that is continuous development. That's critical to the flexibility and agility that the business needs to be able to constantly e evolve those applications. And the third factor is what I call asynchronous uh, scale. So each little function can consume however much memory, storage, and compute that it needs independent of all the other functions in there. Whereas when it was operating as a, at a monolithic application, the traditional approach well, you kind of were stuck with however much the largest uh, footprint was required. Now you get a lot more efficiency at it, you get a lot more availability, and you get continuous development. That's what you get out of containerization. And if you bring that up even, even one more step now, right, and, and I like to use this analogy when I'm presenting to clients, and maybe this is, this is helpful, is if you look at our two, to just take two of our products, right? you take Spectrum Protect, and you take Spectrum Protect Plus, right? Spectrum Protect, you know, uh, 25 years in the industry, number two in the world, everything, right? Millions of lines of code, might even be tens of millions of lines of code. Anytime you have to do anything to that code, like I want it to support X, all 10 million lines of code need to kind of make sure it's adaptable to that thing and it needs to be able to lift and shift. And you talked, we were talking about agile development, which we do now, but you were also talking about, you know, the, the release trains and all that stuff, right? And what ends up going in and out versus Look at Spectrum Protect Plus, built on an agile development, built on microservices. I want to put it in a service. I want to. I can just grab that service and plug it in pretty easily. I don't have to kind of drag all that code kicking and screaming, so to speak, along with it. But um, now I want to ask you a question, Stu, because I tend to think the analysts, as well as kind of the thought leaders in any company that are trying to think about the helping uh, sellers sell and that sort of thing, we're about 12 to 18 months ahead of the customer. We have to be because we got to kind of see what's out there. Then. What are you hearing around this containerization, refactoring? I think we have an opinion. It'd be interesting to hear an outside view of what, what you think is happening. Sure, Steve. And in the last few years, I spent a lot of time you know, going to the cloud shows. I go to KubeCon, going to my second year of doing serverless comps. So look, yeah, the, you know, serverless functions as a service, we're, we're still in the early adopter phase. Some cool startups out there. Um, I, I'm excited to talk to real customers that are doing some cool things. Um, but even I asked Andy Jassy, of you know the CEO of AWS, he had made some comment. You know, if we had said a couple of years ago, if Amazon was built today, it would be built on AWS. And, and he had made this: if Amazon was built today, it would be built on like Lambda and serverless. And I was like, come on, really? And he's like, well, no. I mean, what I mean is that's the direction we're going, but no, we're not there yet because we can't run you know, one of the global, biggest global companies in the world on this yet. So look, we understand what can be done today and what can't when we talk service. Containers, containers are doing phenomenal. Uh, the, we're, we're now, uh, containers have been around over a decade. You know, Google's been talking for <laughs> many years of how many billions of containers they spin up and down, but uh, I've, I've talked to much smaller companies than you know, the Googles and Yahoos of the world um, that like containers are moving in that environment. I'm not sure we've completely crossed the chasm to the majority, but most people have heard of Docker. Uh, they're starting to play with these things. Um, you know, companies like IBM and everyone else have lots of offerings that leverage and use containers because a lot of these things, it just gets baked in under the hood. Um, yeah. When we talked to, you, you brought up virtualization, it's like, oh, 
it's, you know, we watched this wave from the last 15 years of virtualization. It's just pervasive. We don't even think about it. Sure, there's environments that aren't virtualized for a certain reason, uh, if it's containers, but you know, when you see Microsoft get up on stage and talk about you know, how they've embraced Linux, and a lot of the reason that they've embraced Linux is to do more with containers, uh, that's there. So uh, containerization is going strong, but when you talk about the spectrum of applications, yeah, we're, we're still early because the long pole in the tent, at least from customers I to, it's those applications. If I've been running a company for 20 years and I have my you know, database that keeps everything running, you know, making a change is really hard. If I'm a brand new application, oh, I'm doing some cool, you know, this is, you know, NoSQL, MySQL, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it, cool uh, application. So it, it's it's a spectrum, as you said, as we've been talking about, Steve. But um, yeah, it's the the progress is definitely happening faster um, than it ever has. But um, you take those applications. There's a lot of them that I need to either start with a lift and shift, and then talk about refactoring things uh, because so make, making change in the application stuff. APIs we haven't talked about yet though. Right. There's a critical piece into this is worry about, okay, we're just going to have <coughs> API sprawl just like we have with every other thing uh, well, in I, IT. I, I definitely want to get to APIs, but well, one more, just one more piece of color. Yeah. When you're at these conferences and, yeah. the, and the users are there listening to the folks, yeah. the one more piece of color is, do they have, applications run the business. Yeah but it has to sit on top of something. So there's the infrastructure piece. What are the questions around refactoring and containerization that happen around infrastructures? I'm trying to think about how to get from A to B. What do I think about the underlying infrastructure? Or, or is that even a conversation? Because a lot of this stuff is cloud native, right? I mean, or can be cloud native. Yeah, um, and the, the nice thing about containers is, you know, it just lives on top of Linux. So, uh, you, you know, if I've got skill set and I understand that, it, it's relatively easy uh, to move up that way. Um, yeah, if, for, for a lot of the developers, when they say the nice thing if I do containers, if I do Kubernetes, I really don't care. The, the answer is yes. Am I going to have stuff in my data center? Yeah, of, of course. Am I going to do stuff in the public cloud? Uh, yes, and that's um, if I can have the same Linux image. Uh, we've been talking for years about how much of the stack do I need to make sure is the same both places to make it work because that was always the last mile of, okay, it's tested, my vendor said it's good, but I get it, and okay, what about my application and my configuration and what I did? You know, when I use Salesforce, I need, don't need to worry about it. I can pull up on any device. Well, the mobile is a little bit different than the browser, but for the most part, I'm um, anywhere in the world or I work for any company, it's relatively the same look and feel. Um, so a little bit long answer on this, but when it comes to containers, what we've been trying to do and what I found really interesting is the nirvana has always been, I don't want to worry about what's underneath the stack. Um, and when I said, I mentioned this cool, the cool new thing, serverless. But the reason for that yeah. is the business with containers yeah. gets that continuous development and continuous availability and scalability all in, this, in that infrastructure. The infrastructure enables that, right? So I, in, in my mind, the reason people want to do it is they know, they, you know the speed of change in their business is never going to get any slower. Yeah. And this platform enables that speed of so, change. So the one thing, those of us that live through the virtualization world, right. Virtualization, great. I don't need to worry about what server or how many servers right. or anything. Yeah, but the storage and networking stuff, oh, wait, that kind of all broke. That was and we spent a question. decade fixing that. And trust right. me, when when containerization first went, I like three years ago went to a conference, somebody, it's like, it's so much faster than virtualization. It's this and this and this. And I got up, I'm like, hey, uh, what about we've all got <laughs> the wounds and, you know, <laughs> you know, less hair now that we've gone through a decade fixing all of these issues. What about this? So. Uh, you know, Docker did, did a great service to the industry, helped make containers available broadly, uh, and have done a lot. I'd say networking is a little bit further along mm -hmm. than storage is. Most of the things, you know, we talk serverless, it's mostly stateless today. When we talk containers, okay, where's my repository on the side that I do things? So, you know, state is still something we need to worry about. Um, so, you know, yeah. That said, you know yeah. we've made a big investment in, in our ability for our block storage to, and, uh, by the way, all of our file storage offerings to be able to work with um, both Kubernetes and OpenShift. So, you know, those are two of the predominant prevalent um, container-based systems out there. So I think that at least it gives kind of that ability to attach anything that needs persistence to our store. So, so it, it, what, what I'd love to get your perspective on, because we talk about, boy, these changes that are happening mm -hmm. on the infrastructure side. For a while it used to be, okay, uh, business needs a new application, let's go build a temple for it. So 
The business people says app, and then the infrastructure comes team said in, okay, I got the building specs, give me a million bucks in 18 months, and now I'll build it. Well, today, <laughs> you don't have as much money, you don't no. have as much time, Sure. but that relationship between infrastructure and application, they've got to be working so much closer. So how, how do they, <laughs> you know, how, when I'm building this, who is that that builds it, and how, how do they work even closer? Well, this, this uh, we can talk about the uh, infrastructure developer, I guess, too, because really, this is the role that kind of is, is an evolution from what maybe was in the past a storage uh, administrator, right? It's somebody who is setting up a set of policies and templates and classes of storage that abstracts the, the physical from the physical or from the, from the logical so that the uh, application developer who is going into Kubernetes or into OpenShift says, I need a class uh, B um, usage for storage that has backed up and maybe replicated. Um, or I need a class C that is backup replicated and highly available. And the storage administrator in that case is setting up those templates and just simply making sure that he's monitoring all this so, so that when the ad additional demand comes, he just plugs it in and starts to continue to add more. Okay, so I've talked a lot to developers. I, I haven't run across infrastructure developer to, uh, yeah. be before as a, as, a, as a term, so where do they come from? What's their skill set? Maybe, maybe help flesh that out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I was just saying. I think in, in a number of uh, in a number of customer presentations I've given uh, over the course of this last year, uh, it's come up a number of times. So I think, and it, granted, in, in the larger in the larger companies, and it, it typically comes across in a chart that doesn't show that shows not the number of people are changing, but the skill set in the different organizations right. I have are yeah. changing. So today, where I spend a lot of time doing administration. Five years from now, I'm not going to be doing that much administration. So what I want <coughs> are, are capabilities. Well, first of all, I need to program the infrastructure so that it's programmatic to either the application, connect through APIs, so maybe I have a chef or puppet doing uh, DevOps. But when I make that call as, as, a, as a developer in the company to chef or puppet because I want this, to Rob's point, everything underneath that particular It's orchestrated underneath there. It's, There's a set of policies that are set right. that says, this is what how much compute, how much network, what kind of storage you're going to get. That's the infrastructure developer who's set using APIs that are in the infrastructure and at the higher level uh, platforms like Kubernetes and OpenShift that basically allow that developer that just says, I, I need some of that, I need some of that. The experience is not a lot different than what they get with Amazon Web Services or Google Apps, uh, App Server. It's, the, it's a similar kind of experience, but you can do this on, on premises now. Yeah, and, and it, yeah, it's very similar as you said, and it makes a lot of sense to me because for sure, Chef Puppet Ansible, been hearing lots of people talk. Right. That's the people, it's like, you're not configuring LUNs anymore, I don't need to do all the old masking and all the configurations. Right. The network people, it's like, oh, d no, you've, you've got a different job and it shifted. That whole vision of infrastructure as code is starting to exactly. you know, come to fruition. And we talk a lot, in, or at least I do, right around, around IT, IT and technology and infrastructure is made up of three things, people, process, and technology. And the people are evolving just as fast as the infrastructure needs to evolve, right? So tomorrow, I want to be building a programmatic infrastructure today so that my people can be focused on, like you said, where is the future? I, I don't know, but I constantly need to be thinking like the analysts think. I need to be 12 to 18 months ahead of the company so that I can continuously evolve that infrastructure and help them get there, but I don't disrupt the flow of the people that need access to the data or the applications or that sort of thing, right? It's got to be constant, right? And that's how that skill set is changing. Okay, so is that what's that infrastructure developer's role in helping with the app modernization? How do I figure out, you know, what do I just build new? What do I move over? How do I start pulling things apart? Yeah, I think it, I think it definitely starts as uh, look by looking at the different applications that they have. I think you, you made a good example where, okay, so now I want to I want to modernize as much as I can, and now I want to start drilling into by 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 taking a break gaining some knowledge and some insights about containerization and APIs and that sort of thing, and figuring out which applications in my stack today I can refactor, which makes sense to uh, build out of microservices, you know, refactor into microservices and that sort of thing. Start doing that, get that done, and then start looking at ahead of, of that, what's next, right? So getting that infrastructure programmed and plumbed ready so that anyone who needs to access it can, so it's more hands off. Think of Think of the, the younger uh, generation coming into, into technology today, right? 
I want to use my iPhone, I want to do this, I want, to, I want that piece of storage, I want it to be a click of a button. I as an infrastructure developer need to help set that up and make that happen so that as, I, as we move forward, I'm doing other net new things. Would you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. So at the end of the day, those guys are basically taking advantage of those large pool of services, whether it be storage, networking, or computing, creating APIs or leveraging APIs in that infrastructure and wiring it up so that the end user developers can go and access them at, at will without waiting. Yeah, uh, last thing I want to ask in, in this segment is, you know, change is tough. And when you, you might look at my application portfolio, it could be a little bit daunting. So w what sort of things should they be doing to make sure that they're, they're ready for the, the modernization, the transformation to get along that journey a little bit faster? Well, the first thing is is that you've got to have a software-defined infrastructure to be able to do any of this. And, and basically what that software-defined infrastructure has is has a number of attributes, the first of which is an actual separation between the physical and the software. Um, it has policies. It has the ability to APIs that allow you to control that, that, that are either through command line interfaces or uh, REST interfaces such that it can be orchestrated. And then uh, you take advantage of all those policies such that you can automate it, monitor it, and manage it centrally. Um, that is the, you know, the, the base definition of software-defined infrastructure. And we've had it with, with uh, CPUs for a long time. Um, we've had it with networking. People have been doing network you know, separation of, of software and hardware. And it's really IBM that is unique in, the, in this business that has a set of software-defined capabilities that I think is different than the rest of the marketplace. Yeah, uh, it's, I mentioned it earlier, but I think I'll close on it too, is you know, lots of customers, is you've got to modernize the platform, and that, that really sets you up to be able to modernize the applications on top. That's right. All right. Rob and Steve, thanks so much for joining thank us, uh, helping us walk through uh, the data and the applications. Thanks, Stu. All right, uh, thank you so much. I'm Stu Miniman, and appreciate you watching theCUBE.